was standing by my window. I saw that bus for Jerusalem. And let's bring Allison Weir to the stage of the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalists. Thank you very much. Tonight I'll be talking about Palestine, Israel, and the United States. Um, we hear a lot about Israel from the mainstream media all the time. And thanks to groups like this, now and then we hear about Palestine. But we don't very often hear about the US connection. So that's what I'll be emphasizing tonight. And that's the subject matter of my book, the US connection to all of this. We hear a lot about Israel-Palestine, there's a lot of news reports about it, so of course we always hear about Palestinian rockets. Virtually every news report that mentions Palestinians or Gaza or the, the conflict at all always tells that thousands of rockets have been fired from Gaza. All of your neighbors will have heard that thousands of rockets have been fired from Gaza. Barack Obama deplored that, Trump I'm sure has, every, every president, every politician talks about the thousands of rockets from Gaza. But they almost never tell us that most of these are small homemade projectiles. That's what we're talking about. And they almost never tell, well, in the whole time that these rockets have been fired, which is over a dozen years, I believe, how many people have rockets from Gaza killed? Thousands of rockets over 12 years. Well, the last time I counted, I believe it was 30 people. If you add in mortars, it gets up to, I believe, 47 people. Those are 47 tragedies. I would not minimize that, but that's the number that the media don't tell us. Fair-minded people, I believe I'm probably in a room full of, of fair-minded people, I hope, would ask how many people in Gaza were killed during the same time period that the rockets were fired, and the answer to that is, it was 5,700 Gazans a few years ago. Now, of course, it's larger. What's going on, as many of you know, but many people don't know, I didn't know before, is that we hear about Israeli deaths. We hear about the children, Israeli children, who have been killed. We often learn their names, see their, their pictures, see their parents, and we grieve for those children as we should. But we almost never hear about the Palestinian children who've been killed. We don't see them. We don't learn their names. We don't see their parents weeping for their children. And so we don't grieve for them either, because most of us don't know about all of those children. It's my view that we should know about every one of those children. I think we should grieve for every one of those children. If you look at the chart, you'll notice that 91 Palestinian children in the cycle of violence from 2000, 91 Palestinian children were killed before a single Israeli child had been killed. But the media always tells us that Israel is retaliating. Well, the chronology shows us that time after time, Israel initiates the violence. I can go back in detail about that. Since they don't tell about these Palestinian children, we don't know how did they die. Well, I counted the, this up. This is all very well documented. I'm not talking about archaeology tonight. So I counted up the, the Palestinian children that were killed, were killed at the beginning, and I discovered that the number one cause of their deaths was gunfire to the head. The media also don't tell Americans that we give Israel over $10 million per day of our tax money. We have given Israel far more of our tax money than anybody else. All, all the starving countries in the world put together have gotten less money than we have given to Israel. I believe that if Americans knew that our money was being used to shoot children in the head, I believe that all of us would have stood up and demanded that it stop. But we didn't know about it, so we didn't do it. It's too late for those children. But if we did it now, all of those children in the next weeks, months, and years that will die 
more and more columns of Palestinian and Israeli children that will die. We could stop if we would all stand up and refuse to let our money be used that way. Many people ask me how I became involved. Since I don't happen to be Jewish or Palestinian or Muslim or Arab, some people assume therefore I must be anti-Semitic since I'm talking about Palestine and yet I'm not of any ethnicity that I guess is allowed to talk about it. So I like to tell people how I got involved and, and how negligent I was for most of my life. I, I was involved in other issues like most of you in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement during Vietnam, etc. But I, I didn't know about Israel-Palestine. But then finally, in fall of 2000, the second intifada, as it's called, intifada just means uprising, shaking off of oppression. When the second intifada started in fall of 2000, I finally decided to pay attention and to just try to follow the news coverage and understand what it was about. And as a journalist, I was a very small town journalist. As a journalist, I quickly noticed that I was hearing one side of a conflict that has two sides. I would hear from and about Israelis in great detail, as we should. I wanted that information. But I expected also to hear about Palestinians. But I noticed that came much less often and with much less detail. And so at that time, as you may remember, Google was just starting. We could do searches and, and discover things. And I, I did that. I started to go on the internet to see what I could learn. And I found that there were excellent news sources from the region itself. Palestinian media, Israeli media, human rights organizations there on the ground that were sending out daily reports of what was going on. And I started to read those every day, every night after work. And I was horrified at what I was reading and the cover-up that I was noticing here. I remember one news report that I read was from the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. It was reporting about the findings and of a, an Israeli academic. And in that Israeli newspaper, it said that although by that time I knew that Israel was shooting large numbers of unarmed demonstrators in cold blood, including children, but then I read in this article that their strategy uh, they're very calculated in what they do, the government. The strategy was to not kill too many of those Palestinians because if they killed too many, they were concerned that maybe the world would notice and maybe something would happen. So apparently they were keeping the killing to low enough amounts that it was okay. But they were injuring multitudes intentionally. In fact, according to this Israeli report, they were specifically targeting knees and eyes because injuries would be off the radar. With that kind of information and my new awareness that it was my tax money that was doing it and my negligence for most of my life that was enabling it, I decided I would go over and see for myself what was going on. And so began the most unusual trip I've ever undertaken. Many years before, I had been in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan. In that case, I had a very official support system helping me. In this case, I was going to be traveling alone. I had no organization helping or guiding me. This was before ISM, etc. And so when I landed on, on February 7th, 2001, at 8 p.m., I remember experiencing a, the pang of disquiet I'd been trying to ignore on that very long airplane flight. What was it going to be like for me as a single female American to wander alone through a largely Muslim land that was in the middle of a violent uprising? And that was the epicenter of a region that we're continually told to this day is hostile to Americans and to women. What was it going to be like for me to wander around alone? I found that people were welcoming, kind, normal people who love their children. I traveled randomly throughout Gaza and the West Bank, occasionally getting lost. I found out that it was a population full of 
joy and happiness and grief, I also found out what was being done to them. I remember traveling throughout the, the, both the West Bank and Gaza, and I'd be going along, and suddenly there would be an Israeli checkpoint, stop you in the middle of supposedly Palestinian territory. And by checkpoint, as I expect you know, I don't mean a toll booth. I mean soldiers with, in combat gear with machine guns. I remember almost getting used to that. I remember arriving at a, at a, a corner in, in Gaza in particular and uh, seeing uh, soldiers in a tank with a fixed machine gun aimed straight at you. You hoped they waved you on rather than shooting you, as they did some people. At night, you couldn't see the soldiers very well in the dark, but you could see the flashlight with which they signaled whether or not you could continue driving, whether or not you could continue living. That was just routine. That was in the good parts of Gaza. The less desirable parts looked like this. These are the pictures that I took. Please remember, this was early 2001. This was before a single rocket had been fired from Gaza. This is what it looked like. This is years before Hamas was elected. This is what was being done. As I was going around this area, crowds of people would gather around me. They were smiling at me and welcoming me to their Swiss cheese homes. Children would come and, and show me spent bullets that were everywhere. And at one point as I was going around this, this is the Tufa area of Khan Yunus in Gaza. I remember there was suddenly Israeli gunfire very near. We all sort of ducked and, and moved away from that area. I remember there were beautiful agricultural lands, beautiful agricultural lands being destroyed. Next to the beautiful blue Mediterranean Sea, they were being wiped out. I remember talking to farmers who had farmed there forever. Their fathers had farmed that land, their grandfathers, their great-grandfathers, generation upon generation had farmed that land. And now their crops were destroyed, their orchards were destroyed. I wondered how they would feed their children. I wondered how does a farmer feed his children when everything is gone? And that's what it was like before it got bad. I don't like seeing suffering. I don't like seeing children in pain. But thousands of children, I was aware, had already been injured by that time through the use of my money. So as a journalist, it was my job to see them. And all I had to do was go to the nearest hospital. That's all you have to do. And I saw children with bullets in their backs, off in their backs, they're running away. But also in their stomach, in their teeth, in their legs, in their chests. I saw a little brain-dead boy who had been shot in the head. I remember I saw one boy whose parents were happy to see me because they thought that as an American, maybe I could help their poor son. So I asked the doctor if maybe I could do something. Perhaps a surgical team could come or their son could be flown to the United States. And the doctor told me in front of the parents who didn't speak English, he said that he hadn't found the right time and the right way to tell the parents yet, but that their son was totally and eternally paralyzed. And so I knew something those parents didn't know, and I wished that I didn't, and now you do too. I went to the West Bank, and I remember there was a, a little boy who had just been shot. I went to his home, and I saw the flowers in the living room, the ball hanging over the front door that said, God bless our home, the family photos on the wall. I remember when the family, the parents got home from the hospital and the mother was weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. There were so many deaths. There were funerals pretty much every day. I remember in one funeral I, I, I was there with the crowd interviewing people and I ended up talking to this woman whose friend had just been killed and she told me about her friend who had uh, three sons, 18, 14, and 12. And uh, she said that just a few days before her friend had asked her what it was like to go to college in the United States, 
this woman had gone to college in America because her 18-year-old son wanted to go to college in America. But this woman explained to me, of course he won't go now. He'll stay home to help with his brothers. And then on future trips, I've been back a number of times, I saw the wall imprisoning the people still more, confiscating still more land. I saw the Kafkaesque way that you get out of Bethlehem if you're even allowed out of the prison that Bethlehem has become. And when I went back to Gaza last, about five years ago, this is what parts of it looked like. These had been full of people when I was there before. And so when I came back to the United States in 2001, I started an organization called If Americans Knew. And I didn't accept some Americans. I didn't say if liberals knew, if leftists knew, if, if Jews knew, if Muslims knew, if Christians knew. I just said if Americans knew. We also especially focus on media coverage because I feel strongly that the most powerful institution in a country that is a democracy or a republic, the most powerful institution are the news media. That's how we learn what we think we know, whether it's Fox News or KPFA. It's the news media. So we decided to do studies of news coverage on this issue to try to quantify what was going on. My son is a scientist. I like the idea of a sort of scientific study that will be as immune to subjective bias as possible and that would be on a subject considered universally acknowledged as significant. So we looked at coverage of deaths among both populations. The key word is both. To me, all human beings matter. All deaths are tragic, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, nationality. All of the deaths we're talking about are tragic. We also looked at a, a, a subcategory that's especially important. I feel the killing of children. We all feel that children are illegitimate targets of strife. They're not supposed to be killed, but they are being killed. And we also looked at the first year of the uprising. All of this is on our website in detail. Because as we all know, first impressions are so powerful. They determine for people who they think started the violence, who is retaliating, who is defending themselves. So we needed, first of all, to find out, well, how many children on both sides were killed? To answer this very sad question, using an Israeli source, we discovered 28 Israeli children had tragically been killed, and 131 Palestinian children had tragically been killed that first 12 months. How many of these deaths were covered by our primetime network news shows? Well, we found out that they were reporting Israeli children's deaths at rates up to 13 and 14 times greater than they reported on Palestinian children's deaths. We found that many media report so minimally on Palestinian children's deaths that many people don't even know they're being killed, even though they were killed in far greater numbers and first. National Public Radio, that many people feel is a more reliable source of information, um, that's been attacked by Israel partisans as supposedly pro-Palestinian in its coverage. So a group called Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting Fair decided to do a study of NPR's coverage because that's very serious accusation if NPR was being biased in their coverage. Their researcher, Seth Ackerman, did an excellent job and he discovered that NPR is indeed very distorted in their coverage on this issue, but once again, it's actually in a pro-Israel direction. He found that NPR had covered almost 90% of Israeli children's deaths and only 20% of Palestinian children's deaths. He gave his study what I consider a brilliant title. He called it the illusion of balance because Ackerman found that NPR had carried almost the exact same number of news reports of Israeli children killed and Palestinian children killed, making it look like that was just balanced, unbiased reporting. In reality, that wasn't balanced, that was distortion. I would suggest that was manipulation. 
Often in the last 16 years, when there's Palestinian violence and when an Israeli is killed, we hear that Palestinians have shattered a period of calm. There was a headline of that sort in the LA Times in 2005. I happened to be living in Los Angeles at that time. I saw their headline on the website before the newspaper would be printed for the next day. So I called up the Los Angeles Times because I thought that they would not want to print an inaccurate headline. And I told them that during a period that they were saying was calm, 170 Palestinian men, women, and children had been killed. And that during a period they said was calm, 379 had been injured. Their response to me was, we said relative calm, and they hung up the phone. There's so many omissions, I can just give a few of them tonight. There is dissent in Israel. We almost never learn about that. There are rabbis for human rights, there are women's groups, Israelis against home de demolitions, um, Israelis against torture. There are soldiers refusing to serve in the occupation. We just almost never hear about that phenomenon. Also, many people will say to me, I think maybe in Berkeley people know more, but many people will say, if only Palestinians would use nonviolence. Well, as I'm sure you know, they do every week, every single week. There's at least one nonviolent demonstration, usually two or three. Often in small villages, farmers, I've been there, I'm sure others of you have been there. We've seen farmers, we've been with them. They have nonviolent demonstrations. In, in quite a few cases, people from around the world of all backgrounds and ethnicities come and join in that, including Israelis. But we almost never hear about it. Most of the American public doesn't know it exists. And this is extremely courageous for people to do this because they are inevitably met by fierce violence from Israeli forces. Many people have been killed and injured doing this. Most of them are Palestinian. But some have been from other countries. Uh, some have been Americans. Rachel Corey was 23 years old. Tom Herndell was 21 years old. Some others have been injured. Uh, Emily Hanashewitz lost an eye. Tristan Anderson's from Oakland. Now he's brain damaged and in a wheelchair. The media leave this out. Another omission of a very, very different sort occurred in 2003. This one wasn't far away on the other side of the world. This was in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill. Somehow the media missed this. There was a briefing on Capitol Hill on the findings of the Independent Commission on the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty. Chairing that commission was Admiral Thomas Moore, a four-star admiral. That's pretty high ranking. Also, he had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Also part of the commission was Rear Admiral Merlin Starring. And not just any Rear Admiral, he had been in charge of the whole legal department of the US Navy. Also part of the commission was a Marine General and not just any Marine General. This was Ray Davis. This, this man was the highest ranking Congressional Medal of Honor recipient in the United States. They announced their findings in the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill that Israel had attacked and tried to sink a US Navy ship, that Israeli forces had killed 34 Americans and injured over 170, that this had, according to the findings of Admiral Moore, that this constituted an act of war by Israel against the United States. They also announced that rescue flights to these men had been recalled by order of the President of the United States. They also announced that this incident had been ordered covered up by the President of the United States. Statements of that gravity made on Capitol Hill by military officials of that high rank are newsworthy. And yet there was nothing about them in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the allegedly patriotic network, Fox News, 
missed it? About the only place you could read about that is in the congressional record. It's all there in detail. And the Stars and Stripes newspaper, the military newspaper overseas covered it. Let's look at some of the recent Israel-Gaza wars, 2008 to 9. These are the, the deaths on both sides. I'm sure you know that that's not what a war looks like. That's what a massacre looks like. Then let's look at 2014. They begin the sequence of events that allegedly led to that war was the abduction and tragic murder of three young Israelis. That's where they started. That's where supposedly this all started from. So three young Israelis were abducted and killed. So then there is a massive invasion of Gaza. Well, let's look at the, both populations once again, caring about both, and let's look from the beginning of the year to see if anybody else perhaps had been killed besides the three Israelis. Starting from January, we say, oh, some Palestinians had been killed, including a child. And then February, we say, oh, some more Palestinians had been killed. And we look at March, and oh, even more Palestinians had been killed, including another child. Then we see April, one Israeli soldier and a Palestinian. And then we go to May, and we see, oh, some more Palestinians had been killed, including two more children. But none of those apparently matter. But then we get to June, and we see the three Israelis. And then we look at the next month, and that's what it looked like. Defense News Online said, told about a little bit about what this was. As I mentioned, also, the, the media focused on the abduction of the three Israelis. Well, once again, let's care about both populations. Were any Palestinians forcibly imprisoned? Let's look once again from the beginning of the year through June at both populations and see what the numbers are. Over 2,000 Palestinians and three Israelis. Now, when I began to look into this, I wondered, well, when and how did this start? And how did the US come to have such a special relationship with Israel? Of course, many of you may be my age or possibly even older. One of the first things I learned was that when I was born, there was no Israel. It did not exist. There was Palestine. It was a region when I was born under the British Empire, before that under the Ottoman Empire. So when and how did the violence begin? Not thousands of years ago, the way people are often led to believe. In the late 1800s, the region was called Palestine, and it was without violence as it had been for centuries. The population was about 80% Muslim, about 15% Christian, a little under 5% Jewish, all living together for centuries. So what happened? What changed that? Well, it was an ideological movement that changed it, and didn't, it, it did not originate in that region. It originated in Europe and in the United States to a much greater degree than I had known. This was a movement called political Zionism. The intention and goal was to create a Jewish state in Palestine, even though that meant dispossessing 95% of the inhabitants. What struck me when I was writing my book, and still strikes me, is that Zionism is an extremely significant ideology. And yet most Americans have not heard about it and could not define it. I went to a 50-year high school anniversary and I tried it out on some you know, very intelligent classmates. Do you know what Zionism is? And they would sort of say, let me think now, I've heard of that. What is that? That's what I would have answered. And yet we have all know socialism, communism, fascism, capitalism, etc. And yet Zionism has tragically impacted the Middle East, dangerously impacted the whole world, and extremely, has been extremely damaging to the United States as well. And most of us don't even know about it. Well, I discovered that political Zionism 
began the United States, in worldwide, but in the United States, especially I'm focusing on, in the late 1800s. By 1910, it was already becoming a significant movement. It was already becoming the kind of movement that politicians pay attention to, especially in the larger eastern cities. It was a minority, a small minority of Jewish Americans, most of whom were not Zionists, some of whom were actively anti-Zionist. But it was a significant number of people, 20,000. I think by 1920 it was 200,000. Then in 1914 there was a very significant development a prominent man, a prominent attorney from Boston, Louis Brandeis, became the head of world Zionism. World Zionism moved to the United States under Brandeis for a period. In 1916, Brandeis became a Supreme Court Justice. But most of us do know about Brandeis. He's very respected, he was very significant, and yet there were, I hadn't realized that he was in charge of world Zionism. Um, but then I discovered even more about him that was very sad for me to learn. I found that what happened is when he became a Supreme Court Justice, the, the normal practice is you resign your, your memberships and your affiliations because you're supposed to be neutral and not have even the perception of conflict of interest. So, so he, he resigned his leadership of world Zionism but he continued secretly to lead it from his Supreme Court chambers. This was written about a number of places. His loyal lieutenants, one of whom was Felix Frankfurter, who also became a Supreme Court Justice, would come into the chambers of Brandeis and report on how they were doing with pushing Zionism in the United States, and Brandeis would give them directions to go and carry out. That was shocking. But then I discovered something even more shocking, and I'm just the messenger of this bad news. I did not create it. I get attacked for it. But I didn't create it. I just discovered it. I read a book called Israel in the Mind of America by a well-regarded journalist, author named Peter Gross. He was at the New York Times for many years. He was at Harvard. He wrote a number of other nonfiction books. He is, um, if anything, he tilts towards Israel. He's certainly much more sympathetic to Israel than to the Palestinians. And in his book, he, d he wrote that there was a secret Zionist society operating in the United States that Brandeis had been a leader of, called the Parashim. And I thought, where in the world did that com come from? So of course, I read the footnote in fact, that's how I got all my information. I read book after book. I'd read the footnotes, get more books. And so I read the footnote and it turned out to be from a scholarly journal, the American Jewish Historical Quarterly, 1975. Has an article we have now posted online so everyone can read it, called The Perishing, a Secret Episode in American Zionist History. Well, who was the author? Was this one of these anti-Semites that we always hear about? This was Dr. Sarah Schmidt, an Israeli professor at a mainstream Israeli university. She wrote about it in that article. She has a whole chapter about it in her book about Horace Callan. It was an elitist society. They were pushing Zionism across the United States. As one of them said, the way to do it was education and infection. That's a quote. There was even an initiation ceremony when somebody would join this society in which there was a, a, the individual would be inducted and, and swear that they would consider their devotion to Zionism greater than that of family, of school, of nation. And two Supreme Court justices were in that. As early as 1915, a leader of the Parashim, Horace Callan, a professor from the University of Wisconsin, suggested to the British that they might benefit from a declaration in support of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine in 1915. Those of you who have heard of the Balfour Declaration that came in 1917 may be connecting that suggestion. But others, who might be the way I would have been, would wonder, well, what would the British have to do with this? 
Huge as the British Empire was, in 1915, Palestine was under the Ottoman Empire. The British had nothing whatsoever to do with it, one would think. So why, why was Horace Callan suggesting this? Well, let's remember what was going on at this time. It was what they called the Great War. Massive carnage and death. And during the, this war was not just against Germany, that's what most of us remember, it was also against the Ottoman Empire. So if the British won this war, they would defeat the Ottoman Empire and then they would be in charge of Palestine, potentially. So at some parts of this war, early on in particular, Britain wasn't winning it. You know, in retrospect, we know who, how it came out. At the time, you don't know. And in fact, at the battle, first day of the Battle of the Somme, British forces had 50,000, I think it was 60,000 casualties in one day of battle. They were desperate. So some Zionist leaders went to the British government, Heim Weizmann in particular. They said that if the British government would facilitate their colonist movement on Palestine, if they would promise to do that, the Zionists claimed that they would bring the U.S. into the war on the side of Britain. They specifically talked about Louis Brandeis, who was close to Woodrow Wilson, as being one of the venues by which they could accomplish that. This is written in a number of books by, by pro-Israel authors. It was called uh, A Gentleman's Agreement. This is how the Balfour Declaration was obtained with that promise. It's very mild terminology, but it opened the door to colonization of Palestine. Then in the Paris Peace Conference, after the war, when the, the British and the French basically divided up the spoils, the Zionists pushed for the Balfour wording, which would be to allow Jewish colonization of Palestine to go on. When that began, as more and more Zionists and, and misled Jewish individuals who didn't know that they, the, they were going to a, an inhabited land, you may recall that the slogan was a land without a people for a people without a land. So many people believe that slogan. So with the increased colonization, sadly, there was violent conflict. It's predictable, it's sad, but it's predictable. People don't want to be pushed off their land. When they notice what's going on, they will eventually fight back. So there was violence, there were some Zionist terrorist groups were, were created. And again, I'm trying to mostly focus on the US. It turns out that these groups had front groups in the United States, the Ir Irgun and the Stern Gang, paramilitary organizations, terrorist organizations, had groups in the United States that were raising money for them and funneling weaponry to them. The precursor to today's APAC, one of the most powerful lobbies in Washington, D.C., according to Fortune magazine, it's in the top two, is something called the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC. Well, the direct uh, predecessor to APAC was something called the American Zionist Emergency Council, AZEC. This was founded in about 1939, and by 1943, it had a budget of half a million dollars at a time when a nickel bought a loaf of bread. By 1939, it had access to a larger fund that was $14 million, and by 1948, $150 million. I believe in today's dollars, I, I believe that's about a billion dollars that they had access to, to use to propagandize every sector of US society. They not only had lots of money, they used it well. Again, they had written documents about what they were doing. This is written down. They had annual reports about what they were doing. So AZEC specifically targeted congressmen, Christian clergy, editors, professors, both business and labor, Jewish war veterans. They especially targeted the Jewish population with Zionist propaganda. They created hundreds of local committees around the United States. They funded books, made major bestsellers. Other books they didn't like, they called the author anti-Semitic and would bury them. 
They worked to manufacture Christian support since the majority of the population was Christian. So they specifically would used secret funding to uh, have some Christian groups that would also push the Zionist move, movement of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. During all of this time, there was surprising opposition to Zionism from diverse sources. Some of the most distinguished American pastors at the time opposed Zionism for moral and religious reasons. Some went to the Paris peace talks to specifically argue on behalf of self-determination for the Arab peoples. One Dead Sea scholar wrote a wonderful book called Palestine is Our Business. Jewish anti-Zionists were also extremely active, opposing Zionism. Elmer Berger, Alfred Lilienthal both wrote very powerful books. The State Department, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies were also opposed to Zionism. This is thoroughly documented in my book. I have uh, quite a few quotes, uh, starting with, under President Taft, the Secretary of State opposed Zionism under Wilson. He sent a group to, uh, to look at the situation in Palestine, to explore the feasibility of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. The group came back with an extremely powerful report saying it would be a grave trespass on the rights of the people, that Zionism should be abandoned. But their report was buried and had no impact. There was quote after quote saying that this would be wrong, that it would damage the United States, that it would hurt American strategic interests, that it would place America in danger if we supported Zionism. But Harry Truman, like politicians today, our current one and our past president, both basically say, I'm sorry, but I have to answer to hundreds of thousands who are anxious for the su success of Zionism. I do not have hundreds of thousands of Arabs among my constituents. That was Harry Truman. And that's what everybody else has basically said since. In 1947, after World War II, there was increasing violence within Palestine because of the colonization. So there was lots of violence between the two groups, the indigenous Palestinians and the Zionists. Uh, much of the violence was against the British occupation. So finally, Britain turned the question of Palestine over to the United Nations to solve. At that point, the United Nations, this new organization, could have affirmed its charter principle, the bedrock principle of democracy, which is very simple, self-determination of peoples. The people on that land could have finally formed their own country and their own government, free and fair elections. But instead of doing that, even after decades of colonization and immigration to create a Jewish state and to try to buy up all of the land, Zionists had only bought up a total of about 8% of the land. Most people say 5 to 6%. And they were still only 30% of the entire population. They didn't want free and open elections because they were not the majority. So instead, they pushed through a partition plan using bribes and threats, again, very well documented. And they got a partition plan in which 55% of Palestine would go to a Jewish state, even though that population was 30%, and the Palestinians would get about 45%. As we have seen, the more unfair a situation, the more unjust a situation, the more violence that ensues. So rather than bringing peace, it brought outright war. Israel calls this its war of independence. Palestinians call it the catastrophe, al-Nakba. It was a huge, huge humanitarian catastrophe. At least three quarters of a million people were very ruthlessly pushed off their land. Children were dying on the roadside. Nobody knows really how many people died during this. Most Americans didn't know about it. Most of the reporting was done from the Zionist perspective then as now. But some tried to. One was a woman named Dorothy Thompson. Dorothy Thompson, according to the Britannica Encyclopedia, is one of the most important journalists of the 20th century. I think they called her the most important or famous journalist, female journalist of the 20th century. And yet most of us have never heard of her. 
She was amazing. She had a radio program listened to by millions of Americans. She was such a, a celebrity. She was so powerful. She was considered the, next, most power, the second most powerful woman after Eleanor Roosevelt. She was such a celebrity that there was a Broadway play based on her life and a Hollywood movie based on her life. She had been a foreign correspondent in Germany in the 1930s, as was one of the first to raise the alarm about Hitler. She was, in fact, the first foreign correspondent to be ejected by Hitler. So she was very sympathetic to Zionism. But then after the war and after Israel was created, she went over to see this wonderful new Jewish state that had been created, and she saw hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees dying daily, living under very harsh conditions. And so she began to write about them. She was a wonderful writer, and to speak about them. And for doing that, she was called anti-Semitic. She lost her job. She lost her fame for telling about these people. And as her biographer put it, she was erased from history. Now tonight, in the announcement for my lecture, I added that I would be talking about Trump's Muslim ban. Bring this up a little bit to the present. So let's look at that. I've just written an article, and we have it here as a booklet. I hope you will read it. When you read it online, it has citations, all of its embedded links, so you can see where the information came from. Trump's executive order is getting a great deal of attention, as it should. In this, he targets seven countries, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Iran. Well, how did these countries become countries of concern? That was under Barack Obama and Congress and Dianne Feinstein. Legislation in uh, 2015 and 2016 made those same countries countries of interest. That's where Trump got those countries. In the protests, I don't hear that being talked about. It turns out that these same countries, except for one, had been targeted in previous plans. In 2001, all of them, except for one, were targeted to be taken down. This was divulged by a speech given by General Wesley Clark, a four-star general, in 2001, he was in the Pentagon shortly after 9-11, and then he was walking the hall of the Pentagon, and a general came up and said, they're going to attack Iraq. And Clark said, Iraq? Is there some evidence? He said, no, there's no evidence. They're just going to do it. Maybe six weeks later, he was in the Pentagon again. And the officer said, oh, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. They're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. This was in 2001. Then Clark, in his speech, said, then I remembered a conversation I had in 1991 with Paul Wolfowitz. Many of you may know very, very fervently pro-Israel neoconservative Paul Wolfowitz, who had, in 1991, had talked about, this is our chance to clean up Syria, Iran, and Iraq in 1991. Wesley's speech is very strong. He emphasizes this was a coup. There was a coup in the United States, he says. There was a policy coup in the United States by Wolfowitz, by the other neocons, by the Project for a New American Century, he specifically mentions. He said, did you know about this to the audience? Did you hear about it? Was it discussed? Was it debated? No. It was just put through. There was a 1996 plan on behalf of Israel called A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm. This was a, a position paper, a strategy paper, for Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli leader, written by American officials. The realm they were talking about protecting was Israel, not the United States. And in it, they specifically talk about the need to shape Israel's environment, to take down, to 
damage to fragment the countries around Israel. As Clark said, they wanted to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down, make it under our control. That was the plan, and they did. We invaded Iraq, largely on behalf of Israel. This is written about openly in the Israeli press. This is in my article, I won't go through it all now. Now, is that where it started in 91? No. You go back to 1982. There's something called the, usually we call it the Yanon Plan, Oded Yanon. The full title was A Strategy for Israel in the 1980s. This was published by the World Zionist Organization. It's online also, very long document. It called for the dissolution and downfall of existing Arab states. It specifically mentions Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Lebanon. Here are some quotes from it. The entire Arabian Peninsula is a natural candidate for dissolution, breaking Egypt down. If Egypt falls apart, countries like Libya, Sudan, or even the more distant states will not continue to exist in their present form and will join the downfall and dissolution of Egypt. These are direct quotes. They talk about Iraq. Quote, Iraq, rich in oil, is guaranteed as a candidate for Israel's targets. Its dissolution is even more important for us than that of Syria. Iraq is stronger than Syria in the short run. It is Iraqi power which constitutes the greatest threat to Israel. An Iraqi-Iranian war will tear Iraq apart. There was a war. And cause its downfall at home even before it is able to organize a struggle on a wide front against us. Every kind of inter-Arab confrontation will assist us in the short run and will shorten the way to the more important aim of breaking up Iraq into denominations as in Syria and in Lebanon. This is a direct quote from 1982. Did it start in 1982? No. Let's look at 1954. This is again online. This is a, a, a book that I read a number of years ago. I just never got around to talking about any of this in my other talks. By Moshe Charette, his diary was written about by his daughter, and it's quoted, that already from Israel's earliest days, were the, were, there were plans to dismember the Arab world, defeat the Arab national movement, and create puppet regimes. Ben Gurion talked about a plan for putting a Christian in charge of Lebanon and breaking Lebanon up. And they've done that to these regimes. We've done it. We've done it. WikiLeak divulged one of Hillary's emails in which he said the best way to help Israel is to help the people of Syria overthrow the regime of Bashar Assad. So here's Syria. Here's what's been done to Syria. I can't remember how many million have fled, either externally or internally. 300,000 at least are dead, 300,000. And then as the UK Guardian very honestly said, the disorder and chaos that we see now in Syria, with multitudes of people fleeing, going into Europe, some trying and hoping to come here, UK Guardian wrote, disorder and chaos sweeping through the region would not be an un unfortunate side effect of war with Iraq, but a sign that everything is going according to plan. That was the plan. And now we have tragedy growing in Europe. Death's there. France. But before this picture was this one picture of a Syrian boy. And before that little Syrian boy was this Palestinian boy in Gaza. All of this is going on and on and on and going on and on and on with our tax money. I'll just finish with a letter I wrote while I was in Gaza on my first trip. I wrote to Americans back home and I'll just read it now. I wrote Come to Palestine and see how your tax dollars are spent. Visit a hospital with me and see a boy with a bullet hole in his back. 
see children with scared eyes and legs that don't work anymore, a terrified old man whose neck is swathed in bandages from the bullet that passed through it as he sat in his home drinking his tea. Come with me and visit mothers of dead, injured, gone children, thousands of them, and tell them how you didn't know we supplied the weapons that ripped flesh, broke bones, destroyed lives, destroyed lives. Talk to old women who are made to kowtow to uzi-toting 19-year-olds who tell them, no, you can't go to visit your son today. No, you can't take a drive in the country. No, you can't go to the hospital and have your chemotherapy, your dialysis, your operation, and watch as they die. Come to the borders with me, invisible lines in the sand between towns that Israel has drawn with its tanks and helicopters and 200 <coughs> nuclear weapons, and watch the women with difficult births deliver dead babies and then die themselves at military checkpoints, death points, when soldiers with their ultimate power decide not to let them pass. Listen to these young warriors with their lethal weapons and deadly tempers proclaim, we've decided to close this road and if you don't like it, we'll shoot you as we already have 10,000 of your countrymen. Don't look at us wrong or we'll shoot out your eyes as we have 28 of your children. We're not cruel, we left 27 of them with one eye. Go home, Arab, and wait and pray we don't decide to shell it as we have thousands of those others who were in our way with the wonderful singing missiles the U.S. gives us. Go harvest your crops, Arab, until we decide to bulldoze your 100-year-old date palms and ancient olive groves, your strawberry fields forever gone. Come to Palestine, Americans, and see your tax dollars at work, millions and millions of them, every day, every day and weep with me for our victims and our guilt, and then say, no more. Thank you. Yeah.